we start the first in-person reading group since a year, I think. <laughs> and yeah, we were very happy that today Claudia will be presenting uh, monopsony in online labor markets. And yeah, double machine learning estimator. So very curious about what that's going to have in store for us today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So thank you, David. Thank you for organizing. And it's a pleasure to be <laughs> the first presenter after so many months. Uh, uh, with, with some benefits, uh, I guess, uh, for some people who really miss uh, in-person uh, seminars and some thoughts with this technology and problems. But uh, without further discussion, let's um, get into this uh, paper, which was published uh, last year in the AR, AR Insight by uh, Dube, Jacobs, Naidu, and, and Suri. Um, so I did first some background. Uh, this would be mostly economics background. Uh, to motivate the, this, the study, and then we'll talk a bit more of why uh, this is interesting for this group, um, for this uh, uh, soda cups group, for really good. Um, so the starting point really of this paper is the observation of fact that so far, uh, for many years in labor economics, uh, non uh, imperfect labor markets have been seen as kind of a, a something that happens, but not that often, okay? And the standard example here of the monopsony uh, type of um, a labor market, so a, a perfectly non-competitive labor market is the case in which you have only one firm in one small town employing all workers. That's the case of perfect monopsony, a rural town in Western Australia where there is only one mining company employing everyone, okay? And so that used to be seen as kind of a case which is not often happens in labor markets and indeed for people like me who teach labor economics uh, if you look at textbooks of labor economics such as Boras you will find one paragraph almost or one section in a chapter talking about monopsony but that's it some more modern uh, let's say more modern some other textbooks uh, use uh, uh, that they have some more sections on this but basically this idea that labor markets are not as uh, competitive was relatively minor in labor economics, with few exceptions such as money, uh, with Professor A.C. had just been thinking about this one option or non perfective uh, non perfectly uh, competitive labor markets for much of time. Um, so that's the reading if you really want to know this about uh, monopsony um, uh, or, or uh, non perfective uh, non perfectly competitive labor market, it's book by money if you just have now, in more recent years, however, uh, economists, probably because we now we have better data or because the labor markets are changing themselves, um, economists came to realize basically that labor markets are not as competitive as we originally uh, thought. And this can be due to a number of reasons. Uh, one of them is that employers uh, 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 in labor markets, that labor markets are becoming, there is some evidence on that, much more concentrated. Okay, so nowadays there are big employers, Amazon, Apple, Google, that employ large share of, of workers, uh, and that keep becoming bigger and bigger, in, uh, incorporating other, other firms. And that, of course, creates uh, restrictions in the competition also, not only in the product market, probably, but also, which is something that IO people have been thinking for a long time, but also labor markets, uh, where this, this idea is relatively new. Okay, so there is studies there, and this is one of, of those studies, this paper by Hazard, which looks at, at how this concentration of change in concentration across labor markets affect wages, finding indeed that where labor markets are more concentrated, uh, wages are lower. Okay. And so this is first piece of evidence. Then there is some other paper uh, also recent by Google and Ashen Burton, for instance, they look at these firms that have non-competitive agreements. Okay, for some employers in, uh, for some employees in some firms, uh, basically um, in case uh, their contract is suspended, in case they get fired or they resign, they cannot work for a direct competitor of that firm for a uh, given uh, time period. There are these type of agreements uh, as some firms in the labor market, and this paper basically shows that they restricts the ability, uh, basically creates some market power for these firms, uh, um, imposing these type of agreements on, on in, uh, labor uh, markets. Now, what's important for this paper, however, is that the standard assumption when you have a perfectly competitive labor market is that the labor supply is basically perfectly elastic. And what that means is that wages are set by the market, okay, so there is a market out there 
and uh, this market sets wages basically um, um, in all the school firms, what's the wage that they need to pay for a lecturer rather than an associate professor or a full professor? And firms have no power to change that wage. That's the standard perfectly competitive uh, labor market. In this labor market, if firms cut wages by one cent, they lose all their workers because they would work, go and work for some other firm, uh, which, which pays the market wage. And so in this uh, uh, labor market, perfectly competitive labor market, the uh, uh, labor supply is infinitely elastic. Uh, the labor supply that firms face, or employers face, is infinitely uh, elastic. However, uh, there is little uh, really direct evidence, so there has been little direct evidence so far trying to estimate this elasticity of labor supply. How big is this elasticity of labor supply? Again, this is the elasticity of labor supply that employers face, not the elasticity of labor supply of the entire market. And the reason why it has been hard to establish what's, what's the size or magnitude of the elasticity is that it's very hard to find uh, shocks or random, possibly random shocks to wages that affect one firm to do specific for one firm, and that happened for many firms. Because if they only happen for one firm, then you have one observation, and you know that with many elasticity, you need multiple other firms that are affected by random shocks at their own wages without the wages of other firms being affected. So this is kind of a very hard case to find, and so there is very little evidence on the size of this uh, elasticity. And so with this in mind, what they do in this paper, they use one specific labor market, which is the uh, entire uh, labor market, the Amazon entire labor market. We'll talk a bit more about this uh, in the coming slide. This is just an online labor, uh, labor market to give you an idea where uh, employers uh, go and post their jobs and, and employees can um, uh, accept of these jobs or not. Um, based on this, uh, 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 based on this a specific setting, they estimate or they get an estimate of the labor supply elasticity, and then they use this estimate to evaluate the extent and also the effects of, of uh, monotony value in this specific uh, labor market. Uh, now, why do we care about all this, and why do we care about all this for this specific uh, SODA group? Well, because the type of data that they have um, uh, to conduct this analysis uh, or part of this analysis is high dimension. Uh, talk a bit more about what, what we mean by high dimension in this setting, and I guess also in other settings. Uh, basically, uh, for now, they have a bunch of variables, a large, large number of, of variables, and they use it to perform machine learning algorithms that help them to estimate this labor supply. Uh, as this. And in particular, they use this double machine learning estimator which is something that was recently proposed in the literature and, and, and uh, the band useful in this particular setting. So we spent time talking about what this double and machine learning estimate of is and why it's important. What I think is also cool in this paper is that they not only do machine learning, but they also validate uh, these estimates that they obtain using these high dimensional um, uh, type of estimators with other uh, estimators that are commonly used in the applied field. And in particular, they look at uh, fixed length models, which are uh, used in labor economics quite often, and I guess in many other fields. And also, they, they do some experiments. So, they have some experimental estimates of the same parameter, uh, this uh, labor supply elasticity. And so, they benchmark their uh, machine learning findings uh, with, with each other uh, techniques, which is, I think, also a good example of how applied papers might look like in, in the future, where we will have uh, these high dimensional data coming in, and so we will have to be able to use different techniques, probably to estimate the same parameter or, or, or cross validate uh, this, this estimate. Uh, now, uh, let's say, so this is more the technical part of why we care about this topic. The non technical, but for policy relevant part, and for, for labor economists, uh, in particular, the uh, relevant part is that is the existence of. Uh, the existence of uh, monotony power the labor markets opens up a bunch of other venues that have so far uh, been um, uh, discussed, but not as much because we weren't able probably to fully understand uh, this, this um, uh, type of, of um, um, let's say, some of them are policy interventions, some, other, some others are trends. For instance, there is a huge literature in which I'm familiar with it. Uh, probably will listen to this, but 
he didn't make it to talk he told me but probably we listen because he's a uh, people at birthday card and the clients have been showing for uh, now uh, a, a few years that there seem to be a wage premium attached to working for a specific firm and this firm specific wage premiums so the same worker working at different firms uh, basically that's the fourth aspect so they don't get as close to that, but the, the, that's the idea, is that is there is a firm component of wages that seems to be important to explain how uh, wage inequality evolved over time. However, the standard labor market model cannot explain that, because as we said at the beginning, uh, well, firms take wages as even, but if you introduce more notion in power, then everything changes. So then you can explain these patterns, which have been shown also in, in, uh, in uh, Germany, as an effect of this, uh, uh, of the existence of some Power that allows firms somehow to say something about wages, to set wages themselves. Okay, uh, so that's one thing. And then also other policies, some of which are relevant, for instance, for Australia, such as the minimum wage, which Australia is the highest minimum wage in the world, are usually thought as being uh, uh, saving some, some effects, which uh, some negative effects in, in terms of, employ of employment, for instance. Uh, the standard model would predict if, if, if minimum wage. Uh, if the minimum wage is high, employer employment might go down. This is yet again under the assumption of relatively competitive or relatively competitive labor markets. If you introduce monopsony or some monopsony power in these models, even an increase in the minimum wage might get you close to what the, the, the perfectly competitive equilibrium will be. So it might be indeed might not cost you jobs, basically. And so everything uh, okay, so. This opens up a number of things which now labor economists are exploring, but the first step is to establish whether there is such a power in labor markets uh, or not. For those of you who don't care probably about machine learning as much or probably about policy uh, intervention in labor markets as much, at the end of this paper, they also provide advice for people who use actually these platforms, such as SEMTAR or uh, other uh, online platforms of uh, labor market platforms, uh, which might be uh, useful. So now with this in mind, why do they, they choose or pick this specific institutional setting, which is MTAC, this uh, platform which is provided by Amazon, uh, where employers can basically post a job, okay, and this is what we would call a batch of hit tasks. These are high intelligence tasks, that's a batch of tasks. Is basically a job in this platform. Okay, so if you have, a, for instance, you want to, to, the way it works is basically that uh, what we think as a task. So, for instance, if you want to find an object, all objects of a picture, on MTARC, this job, this is considered a job and is split in many tasks, which are then assigned to multiple workers. Okay, but the job is called batch, is a batch of all these tasks. Uh, okay. Um, so this is the, the way in which this platform uh, in general uh, works. Now, the, this, the, why is it so interesting? Well, because if you did this book by Manning that we mentioned in the beginning there, you would find uh, some, uh, some labor economists uh, saying indeed that we should expect uh, online uh, labor markets or um, uh, virtual labor markets um, to be the perfect case in which monotony shouldn't exist. Okay? So we wouldn't expect to observe that much uh, monopsony power in online markets. Why the reasoning for this early, when, when these markets were, were still not uh, as, as uh, common as they are today, this is, this is an old, relatively old 2003, the reasoning of labor economists at that time is that the online labor markets, such fictions are basically in existence. So employees can move from one employer to another, from one firm to another in a relatively easy way. If I want to, want to find another job as a lecturer, probably I'd have to change neighborhoods at least, or city, <laughs> or even continent, I guess it's not that, that uh, So in, in online labor markets, you don't have to do that. You can pick your employer uh, as freely as you want. And so this reduction in friction or costs associated with switching jobs would imply, and this was the old reason, that uh, there was not that these, these markets were as, as close as we can get to perfectly competitive uh, labor markets, okay, because search frictions are, are very low. What recent papers, however, have shown is that in these markets, there is indeed, even in these markets, there is high concentration. Okay, well, that means that in our entire, for instance, 10% of all costs 
uh, 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 sorry, 99 to 99 to 99 percent of all posts are posted by only 10 percent of the uh, employers. Okay, so the same people. Uh, the same 10% of people post the great majority or almost all posts on Amazon. So there is high concentration on these uh, platforms, which is one of the prerequisites to have some sort of market power. If there are only few employers, then it's true that employees can move across employers as freely as they want, but still there is high probability that they will end up at the same employer who, can, uh, who does have then some, some power in setting wages. Okay, because uh, employees don't have that much. And the second thing that people have observed about this attack is that uh, workers uh, um, do communicate off the platform because the platform itself doesn't provide an easy way for workers to exchange information. And that creates frictions because if workers cannot easily know what are the available uh, options out there, even within the same uh, platform. So if there is no full transparency or on wages in that sense, meaning that we not easily get information on wages across jobs, and we'll talk a, a bit more about this uh, towards the end, then this also uh, creates problems. Uh, again, uh, in workers optimally moving from one employer to the other, which creates uh, features and therefore reduces or increases the power of employers on this uh, labor uh, Finally, um, uh, monopsony can also exist because workers have certain tastes uh, well, or certain preferences to perform certain tasks. For instance, workers might like to program in Python, but they might not like as much to look at pictures or objects into a given uh, picture. Okay, if that, uh, that is the case, uh, then employers can exploit this uh, preference uh, and this uh, gives employers in some, some power uh, uh, that they can exploit in the labor market, okay? And so there, is, there seem to be indeed some of these um, uh, existing also in this uh, online uh, market. So for all these reasons, it seems basically the main point of this slide is that it seems that that will tick all the boxes for the <laughs> Or people originally for for the uh, for for being a non-competitive uh, labor market uh, in the end, but of course the aim of this paper is indeed to show or to test if that's uh, the case or not. Now the other reason why that is so good for this analysis is that it provides the campaign public list could be scraped, and so it provides a huge uh, number of variables that can be used for the analysis to narrow down this estimate of the elasticity of labor supply in the ways that we will uh, see um, uh, later on. But for those in the room who like scraping or, uh, or uh, big data in general, let me uh, spend some time also here just uh, shortly describing this uh, uh, scraping procedures that they used uh, to obtain data, uh, the data that they use for the analysis. Um, yes. Um, I spent like a few months ago with a lot of time as an intern for uh, getting some stuff that's done in there. I mean, there are parts of it that are just like fundamentally different from any other labor markets, like how small the tasks are broken into. Um, and then also that the, uh, the workers seem to like really want to build up like reputation effects. So everything about them is measured in terms of their productivity, how many errors they make. And what I found quite surprising was that um, I got emails because you can accept or reject um, certain tasks. And um, Multiple workers sent me emails afterwards saying, "Can you please check this again?" Um, I did like that. They like kind of uh, almost obsessed with getting that hundred percent uh, record. Can and, you compare different employees for the same task? Yeah, and then they get a sense of whether. Yes. Yeah, and... yeah. So they know that to get the like good quality jobs, they need a, a good reputation effect, and they're really like fighting that. So, I mean, part of them taking the lower wages might be like, well. Um, it's a type of training, building up my CV, um, that kind of thing. So I just wonder if those kind of things will... But some of them will be... Yeah, yeah, yeah they, have a, yes. they have a very large number, as you can... The, the I-dimensional uh, comes here from this very high number of controls that they had in there, some of which might capture what, what you were saying, uh, like the number of tasks within each batch. 
uh, these type of controls, which are usually relatively easily measured, um, uh, they are included in their model, which we will discuss later on. Uh, but again, I guess going to your more fundamental question, which is what's determining in the end is market power uh, by employers. This paper won't be able to say much about it. And whether in the concluding the discussions at the end, we will talk a bit about possible causes for this market power. Uh, for what they do in here is just trying to at least get a sense, let's say, of whether there is market power in these markets and then leave it to future work to fully understand. But that's that's an open question indeed. You got it right at the, at the beginning. And we'll come back to this at the end, uh, saying proposing some some explanations, but still it's there is lots to be done. Let's say this is an open uh, field of research in uh, I can see that right now. And Claudia, sorry, does the paper speak about in my perception? You know, a mechanical term is mainly about this very small task, like find, I don't know, a fire hydrant in the picture type of task, and less, as you said, like Python coding. So yeah, when it yeah. comes to different tasks or more complicated one, ones, I, at the end, it's still a very small subgroup of tasks, which are very particular. Yeah, so I, it's when you think of the set of of jobs that are around in the world, I mean, these things are, I mean, it's basically solving little puzzles or doing as, you know, they call it human intelligence task, but it can reach from very trivial things where it's fine, you get only paid a cent to a bit more complicated things, but it, yeah, it's just one very small portion. Exactly. So that's the other difficulty of, of studying um, on option in general. But in this particular setting, you're ex exactly right. So uh, to be honest, they control um, with, with the others. They control in the best possible way for the difficulty of a given task because on Amazon task, uh, you can specify how long you think that task will take. And they take the test that you can measure the, the, the difficulty of a given job. But again, the overall set of jobs from which they are drawing is still might be a very specific set of, of, of jobs. Um, apply, which is not nice if we want to think at a unified uh, theory of monopsony that might apply to the entire economy. I think the consensus for in this early stage of this type of research, or empirical research, I must say, because there is lots of theory done on this, is that it's very hard to find models that work on. on uh, on, on uh, across sectors uh, uniformly. And so what studies have done uh, is something like this, that they focus on certain specific like labor markets like this, where we think there might be competition, and then they try to understand if there is uh, there is a competition. And there is also other papers doing the same for, for instance, the hospital sector. These are papers uh, showing also that the health sector, uh, uh, the, the, the health sector, uh, if you want. Uh, on hospitals, also there, that doesn't seem to be um, enough uh, competition. This doesn't mean that it applies to, to, to generalize to the entire economy, but just to get a sense that even in those settings, I think again, where we would expect to, to observe competition uh, uh, to be high among employers, even there, as we will see, we don't find uh, much. But yeah, yeah. Thank you. I think the knowledge that, that, uh, that, 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 uh, that, that, that this, this might not help, like, uh, yeah. Yeah, the external validity is still a question mark, let's say. Um, the, uh, the, so they, they use uh, two different types of data, two main types of data. The first one is from, uh, the, basically, it's extracted using a, a, a stacking procedure that was previously proposed in an existing paper by um, um, uh, people in computer science. Um, uh, and, and this, uh, uh, basically, so here I describe how the, the uh, scraping procedure uh, works um, uh, exactly. Um, just to give you an idea, probably go shortly through it. And, and basically, the first one, uh, what he does, he, he, he looks at the newest 200 uh, human intelligence tasks. Again, those are tasks within, uh, sorry, uh, the task within each batch. A batch is a job in, in this uh, setting. He does so every six minutes. That for each hit, at the frequency of one minute, and he follows each hit, each task, at the frequency of one minute to see if that task disappears from uh, the web. When it disappears, they assume this is the standard assumption, which is not perfect, and they uh, know that. Uh, they assume that the job has been fixed okay, when it disappears from the web. But it might be also that the employers decide to withdraw the job for some reason or another, uh, or another setting, but this is the standard assumption in this uh, setting. Uh, based on this, they get 400,000 each batches, 400,000 jobs we can think of them. Um, the problem with this scheduling procedure is that there's 
some point, Amazon changed the interface on which the procedure was based, so it stopped working. So what they did, they developed their own scraping procedure. They implemented that to get under 300,000 jobs in batches. And uh, also that one at some point was banned by Amazon in August 2017, so it stopped working. At that point, they had enough observations and enough variables that they, start, they stopped getting and they started they start writing the paper, I guess, or, or at least they started working on the empirical analysis. Um, so based on this, uh, what they do, uh, based on this information that they have for each batch, uh, each batch basically also includes a description of the tasks that you have to perform. They, uh, uh, use uh, textual uh, analysis, algorithms of textual analysis, something which might be familiar to these objects, like in grams or Dobby distributions, um, dot uh, I won't go into details of those, but uh, in appendix B, they describe they do a good job in describing each one of those uh, uh, um, algorithms that they use, or procedures that they use. They use them to, pro to produce a set of huge set of control variables, okay, that describe in the best possible way the characteristic of this job or this match. Uh, they also have numeric um, um, variable or contextual features that can be extracted more easily. Then, uh, basically, they Sorry, Sorry. Yeah. So, but when they extract those text features, what do they look for? They look for a description of the, this specific job, which is the batch, for a set of a, a huge vector of uh, characteristics that will describe this specific job. So the idea is that you find the similarity between the tasks based on this job, so you kind of control for the yes, okay, based on the type of words that they have. I think this is yeah, okay, okay. The main one that they use, I think, the basic one from where they start is the n grams. All the um, which I think looks at similarity across words. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, so that's the main algorithm that they use to produce these uh, variables. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll tell you how they select. Later on, we'll discuss yeah. a bit more how they select what type of variables to be among these huge. Yeah. yeah. But yes, but yeah. Maybe we get to take the further defining mark of power, I'm guessing, in this context. The theoretical object would be, say, the difference between parameters or wage. And the marginal value product or something like that. And so it's looking like you can't get what this is worth to a firm, right? You're not saying that. So what are we comparing wages to? How do you know? Uh, no, the main object of this, or the first, or the main part of the paper is just to get a sense of whether this elasticity is infinity plus infinity or not, with this elasticity of labor supply. Okay, so if you uh, cut wages by one cent, if you lose all your workers or not, that's the kind of, of the main object of the analysis. Then in the background, they have a search model, okay, where they put some more structure, but not too much, to try to back up what's the loss in productivity that you get. Uh, so how, how much less you pay workers uh, uh, based on what the, the, fair, uh, uh, the wage based on the productivity should be. That's a bit more structural. So there's some uh, um, um, a model to, to get that number. Uh, but um, yeah, the main object is just to study this elasticity, I would say. Uh, but they, they do manage to get a number also on, on uh, this model. Um, I guess just, just to think about the construction, the, I mean, this is why you want a really good machine learning algorithm. But the unobservables will drive everything, right? If there's just so much unobserved heterogeneity and job difficulty, that manifests it looking like a little, you know, yeah. everything great elasticity you know, in the supply curve because you've, you've got all these unexplained matches where we're oh, wait, they dropped it down and then they've got a, yeah. someone to do it or they, yeah, they're able to get someone at a really high price, right? That may just be because there's something inherent to the task that is not. You know, it's just not quantifiable or something like that. Exactly. So this goes back, I think, a bit to the, to the starting point, which is it's very hard to find random variation in wages which are specific to a firm because there are so many things that we can uh, that are happening in a firm that we can't really uh, control for. So there are only two ways they try. 
this way, which I think is particular, not even in this paper, which is they try this machine learning and they see how it does in, a, in a, um, a trying to solve this issue. And they then compare it to experimental, to experiments. But when you do that, experiments are usually at, at the usual problem that they are based on a very specific setting, a very uh, specific set of tasks. So that is also all the problems of external validity, which are, uh, I think, uh, a bit uh, attenuated. Um, in this setting, um, considering also Paul's point of attenuated uh, in a sense, but still uh, um, uh, problematic probably. But uh, the, the, the idea indeed is that yes, we can probably use this, these new algorithms to get a prediction, <laughs> get a prediction uh, and control them in the best possible way. Then we compare it to experiments. And if we don't find that things are too uh, different, then we know that somehow there is market power in this, in this uh, uh, market. Now, what's generating that? Still, I know. All right. So I'll, I'll keep going uh, then. Um, so that we don't run out of time. So the basic model they, they estimate is this one. It's uh, a, a regression of log duration. That's the duration how long the uh, given post survives on this platform on reward. Each batch has a reward. Okay. So each job, uh, when you when you post a job, you need to post also how much you are uh, willing to pay for that specific job, and that's what, what's called the uh, reward. The, uh, um, the, the coefficient of interest for us is this data here. Why? Because in this online appendix, they show that basically if you run a regression of log duration or log rewards based on the theoretical model, the estimated data uh, can be seen as the elasticity of labor supply. Okay, so that's our... Uh, 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 parameter of interest, and they had a search model to explain that, which is not part of the main paper, so I won't spend too much time uh, talking about it, but I won't spend any time talking about it, but if you want to read more about this, this in appendix. Uh, now, the problem, as Gordon was saying, is that we also had this new uh, nuisance parameter here in this model, which basically captures all these covariates or characteristics of a job. Uh, which correlates at the same time with the, uh, how long it takes for the job to be filled and uh, the uh, pay or the wage we can call or the reward of, of, of this uh, uh, job. Okay, so this creates a problem of intervariable bias, meaning that if we don't control for this, uh, other factors in the best possible way, but these factors might be captured by our data, which in the case would be uh, a, a good estimate of the labor supply elasticity that the employer's space, but it would reflect other characteristics that correlate with both the duration and uh, the reward of a given amount of The remaining part actually is assumed to be uh, independent of, um, uh, sorry, it's assumed to be well behaved, meaning it doesn't create any problem of meter variable bias because it's kind of uh, independent of rewards and, and other factors. Uh, now, oh, how do they, uh, so the main problem from this model is how to, to model uh, this uh, uh, mu, uh, sorry, mu. Uh, uh, and there was different uh, strategies here. One is mixed effect model and, and machine learning. I grouped them under two broad groups. One is mixed effect and machine learning, which basically, as we will see, they both try to model these uh, unobserved factors sets being in the a function or either directly observable or a function of observable uh, characteristics. And then the experiments, uh, basically, uh, and then the idea there we'll see at the end would be to randomly assign wages to jobs, in which case, by assumption, because you randomly assign wages to jobs, uh, wages are independent from the other characteristics that might affect uh, uh, job time or, or the duration or the probability of a job uh, uh, being filled. Um, so let me talk shortly about fixed effects. Um, I'll go uh, relatively uh, fast here because it's probably familiar with mo most of the people in this audience. They basically model in this case the unobserved factor as uh, uh, sum of different fixed effects, uh, so a linear function of different fixed effects uh, where uh, rho and, and tau are meant to capture some characteristics specific of the employer who is posting a given uh, job over the time period when the job was posted, and then these delta uh, fixed effects, they capture either the difficulty of a given task, so the minions are uh, dotted or assigned 
by the employer to a given task, which is to provide an imperfect measure of how difficult the task is, and then also uh, the number of uh, eats or the number of tasks within each, each batch, which is uh, also, again, uh, trying to get this uh, a measure of how difficult uh, a job is. Uh, if there are multiple tasks, it means that the job is sliced in, in uh, so many uh, different pieces because probably it's more difficult. Uh, Okay, so this is a, just a, the most basic uh, fixed effect model, and as you can see already, when we go from the OLS model, here we have already an elasticity which is pretty small, so this number is the elasticity at the coefficient of log reward, uh, which is already a bit small but noisy, uh, we go to an even smaller um, uh, coefficient with the right side, um, okay, so we expect always that if wages go up, then uh, uh, the, um, um, the, the labor supply will go up, so this coefficient must be negative uh, because the opposite of the coefficient is the elasticity of labor supply. Um, here, the coefficient is the right side, but it's extremely close to zero. Okay, and uh, it's still very noisy, uh, so it might not say much, but it's uh, the magnitude of this coefficient seems to indicate that this elasticity is extremely close to zero. Remember, we started from the prior of perfectly competitive labor market where this elasticity is plus infinity, and now we are projecting at 0.06. Okay. Um, so, what about machine learning? Okay, so in uh, the second procedure that they try to solve this problem of unobserved uh, variables is to fit a high dimensional function. Of these, all these variables that they have describing the characteristics of this uh, job. I dimensional here means, as probably this is something obvious for many uh, of the people in this, in this um, room, is that the uh, number of variables increases rapidly with the number of observations. Okay, as you increase the sample size, the number of variables that you have uh, available grows uh, fast or faster than. Uh, in a low dimensional uh, uh, case. And this creates a, a number of additional problems that econometricians have been dealing for years uh, in order to uh, uh, narrow down uh, the unbiased and consistent estimators in this setting in which the number of, of variables uh, uh, grows uh, uh, faster sometimes than the number of solutions. Yes. So, something you said, I think it's really important here. This, this is the duration, how long the task stays yeah. on. How many threading data if, if the job's not filled, right? I mean, you can't have an infinite duration to just drop it. I think so. They put, um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't remember. I remember it's yeah. 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 Figure out. This is the yeah, I don't know. How they, yeah, that's a good point. Those are all the tasks probably where it did. Yeah. I just got this point. I, I was thinking, um, okay, this is a really justifiable kind of use for, for, for machine learning, right? Because you would think that there should be some mathematical relationship you think between duration and reward if there's a complexity involved, right? Almost to the high reward task, or well, might be a page of instructions or two or three, you know, and I need to comprehend whether I'm up for it. That's sort of like a mechanical thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, now if you can control the form of the text, okay, now we, we may actually be talking about the price aspect of all this other stuff. Yeah, and yeah, you, exactly. know, you probably can't capture from fixed the things. Yeah, 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 yeah. And all the interaction of these with all the other uh, type of, of, uh, of, of um, uh, observable characteristics that you have, this high dimensional idea that you, you can have, you can construct this, also this whole this interaction. So it's a uh, it's powerful, uh, and if it's it's uh, useful or not, uh, fully useful or not in this setting, I think at the end of the presentation we'll get the sense of that again, comparing with the experiments uh, in which rewards is standard, so it can be correlated with uh, with these other uh, tasks. Now, um, uh, basically, what this double ML uh, um, uh, boils down to is a, an estimation, um, which for those of you who remember the fish found theorem is, is relatively easy to understand that the motivation, I'll give you intuitive motivation. If you want the more econometric rigorous set of motivation for why they do this procedure, you can go to the original paper, which is a very nice paper. Um, um, uh, yeah, I mentioned at the end of this uh, slide. Um, so basically, in order to get an estimate of data uh, there, what they do, they run two regressions. One of duration, 
on a highly uh, on a non uh, high dimensional function of the set of, of vectors. So the vector of, of control C. Uh, okay, this is called uh, M0. Then there are another regression of uh, reward on this uh, set of, of control uh, Z. Again, M0 is also an high dimensional uh, um, function. They got an estimate of the, uh, they get an estimate of the um, um, uh, residuals from the first regression and the second regression. Okay, and, and those are psi and mu uh, hat um, in, in my uh, third bullet point, and then they basically regress the uh, set of regressors, uh, the, the residuals from the first from regression two on the residuals uh, from uh, regression three in order to get an estimate of uh, eta. Okay, okay. So this is an either dimensional case of uh, just a standard uh, partial out estimators where partial out the effect of three using these uh, two regressions rather than running regression uh, one. Now, in the standard fish about uh, uh, kind of work where we, we don't have problems of high dimensionality, uh, the, the two procedures are equivalent. In this case, because we have this high dimensional uh, data and there is uh, some corrections that need to be done in order to keep under control this variance bias uh, trade-off, which is standard in this setting, where if you fit too well the data, <laughs> Then you get that your variance explode, uh, but you, you get a biased estimate of what you want to estimate. You know, for, for that, and this is my intuitive explanation for why in this setting they need to impose basically this statement that show that if you do these two, um, uh, uh, this double ML procedure, so if you estimate two and three, and then based on that, you get the residual that you estimate your parameter of interest, you are able to solve some of these issues that derive from uh, I dimensional data, okay, so this problem uh, uh, of deriving from, uh, from this correction of, of uh, overfitting. Uh, however, some of the problems still uh, remain. Um, and so, what they propose then is to do what they call cross fit, uh, basically, divide the sample in uh, two parts, okay, and use one part of the sample as training. The other one uh, is valuation, get an estimate of uh, eta uh, um, of, uh, uh, yeah, of, of your parameter of interest here, and then uh, do the same in the opposite way, meaning use that as they was used for validation and training at the opposite, get another estimate of the same parameter, and then take the average of this estimate in order to get your uh, right parameter. They basically show that this procedure uh, deliver some bias and uh, consistent estimate of your parameter of interest, which is the data in the question uh, one. Okay, so that's in a <laughs> few uh, words the, the entire um, uh, uh, procedure, uh, how it works, and now we'll see how they uh, uh, apply this procedure to the specific setting of, of this uh, uh, paper. The main contribution in this paper is not to develop this procedure. This procedure is developed by econometricians, so econometricians, a, a bunch of them. This at all includes like Nobel Prize winners. So, <laughs> so it's a it's a, it's a, 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 a team uh, that have who developed this procedure, which then I just apply uh, to this uh, setting with the idea that this uh, estimator here still. The underlying assumption here is uncombined, okay, so which is basically what Gordon was saying that this set of, of uh, vectors can still capture all that is there to be captured about uh, this nuisance parameter uh, new. Under that assumption, this procedure delivers an unbiased and, and uh, consistent estimate of uh, our uh, elasticity of labor supply, which is the parameter of our interest. Um, so, uh, how do they do practically uh, this in this specific setting? They split the sample first in two parts, A and B, and then within each part, they define, a, a, again, uh, randomly, a tiny kind validation uh, sub sample. Uh, sub. Uh, then they run a bunch of, of uh, ML uh, machine learning algorithms um, to, de to, to determine estimates or to, to predict our uh, uh, function of interest and zero and then zero. Okay. Uh, now, for each uh, prediction, they get a score. I think they use R square or some other goodness of fit, measure of goodness of fit for each one of these uh, um, uh, um, 
type of, of procedures of type of uh, machine learning algorithm that they use for estimation. Uh, they do it for A and B separately, and then basically what they do, they select only the uh, machine learning procedure that performs better, okay, in terms of goodness of it. And no matter what they do, or what they use, if they use A or B or B or A, basically what they get, they come to the conclusion that random forest is the best uh, machine learning algorithm uh, in this setting to produce a prediction of L0 and L0. Okay, and they try a bunch of them. Uh, if you, if there is a footnote on the table, I'm explaining what the uh, machine learning procedure they determine. Uh, so they conclude the random forest is the type of algorithm that they want to use to predict this Q unknown uh, high dimensional uh, function. Then, uh, based on this, um, uh, they can also select, based on these three, uh, first three uh, 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 points, they can also uh, select the 100 best. Uh, predictors of reward and duration, okay? So uh, going back uh, to Klaus' question, uh, they use these first three points to select just a, a starting subset of these n-grams um, uh, textual variable that they have uh, to base then their prediction on. Uh, then the real prediction that starts at point five, where they use random forest and a set of uh, best predictors to then estimate uh, the parameter of interest using first this uh, subsample A for training and B for validation, and then crossfit B for training and A for validation, because the econometric paper shows that this is the procedure that delivers the unbiased and consistent estimator. And so finally, they get an estimate of the level supply elasticity. Okay, so that's the way in which uh, this is operationalized in this specific setting. Now, one thing I should say, probably I forgot in the data section, I had a link to the code and data that they use. So these data are available as for every uh, uh, paper which is published in uh, the American Economic Journal and the, 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 the AA, uh, journals, uh, which I'll, I'll upload it and I'll upload them in the, together with other material in the folder that we have for the group. Okay, so if you want to play around with this algorithm or with that data, it's all up there. It's, uh, um, uh, so, yeah. so I remember now I've seen the original presentation after you talked about this. So how did they then go when they estimate this new hat? Yeah, where do they then get standard errors from that? Like the estimation error? Do we know if it's different from zero? How do how is this derived? Oh, uh, I think this is just an OLS estimate. But by the time you get to the um, by the time you get the the, I don't think there is a problem of, of uh, standard errors here because they don't have imputed regressors. That's my my take out. Yeah, I don't know. So, yeah, so, they, so, then... so this is just you know. So by, if it's fine up to here, how they produce this? The, the, yes, it's just OLS. Yes, just OLS. This is just OLS for now. And there's no correction for because of significance testing. You know, like do they take into account of any of the previous procedures for that? Or is this, I don't know what the... You, you, the so the, you are referring to the procedure for the ML? Uh, the, no, the after, after, after the the Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure, I think, I mean, I think that you just can't say, well, that's totally Asymptotically, it's probably a state. I, I okay. think the point yes, of yes. this paper is to show that asymptotically, that the, the and uh, if you do the entire procedure, the uh, the estimate that you get is unbiased and consistent. Okay. Okay. So the standard errors are right. Okay. Okay. okay that's it. Um, so the yeah, but uh, so I, I don't see them. At least they don't mention it in the main text. So that's my assumption for it. And based based on this other paper, that's my uh, the, the theory paper seems to be. But uh, yeah. So it's okay, so based on uh, asymptotic uh, theory. Yeah. Sorry. Um. So what they get is basically this. Uh, they get across all estimates. So they do estimates for, uh, first they do just machine learning in, in uh, so the procedure that I just described for column three. Then they add to the set of controls that come out of machine learning. They also add fixed effects. And then they split their sample based on the year. But basically they get uh, in almost every specification that the elasticity is uh, Precisely estimated that pretty close to I mean, zero. There is some addition across years which they don't explain that well. Um, and then, uh, uh, so, but 
it, it, the overall message from this, this uh, there are a few messages, I guess, from this uh, table. Is first of all, there are still the OCD procedures to be you know, Similarly, uh, similar to what happened for uh, fixed effect volume two. Uh, if we add fixed effect, the magnitude of the elasticity doesn't change as much, meaning that machine learning is able to capture most of the unobserved variation uh, that was uh, captured by fixed effect models. So, or, or in that sense, uh, um, it's the first uh, uh, validation of the machine learning kind of procedure in this technique. Um, and, and uh, yeah, and those are the two messages small elasticity and machine learning relative to fixed effect uh, as well. Um, the other important result that I think they, they are able to show in this paper is that the, uh, this is a bin um, uh, scattered, uh, is a bin scattered uh, behind the estimated uh, elasticity in column three. Okay, so on the uh, Y there, we have the uh, the residuals of the donation and on the x axis, we have the residuals of, of the reward. What they basically show is that these points they all uh, lie pretty close to the uh, linear fit, okay? Meaning that the elasticity of labor supply, if we believe these estimates, is uh, uh, constant relative to the level of reward, which is also a standard assumption in this search model, okay? So they kind of break up that assumption also in their own model. That have in the appendix, this elasticity is thought to be kind of constant relative to reward level. Uh, I guess it's done because otherwise models would be more, uh, more complicated. But they they show nicely that this this assumption probably is not too far from from the end. And uh, finally, what they do to get at, 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 at some of the points that came up during the presentation, they also use data from past experiments that were done on M5 in order to get a causal estimate of this elasticity, which is based on models in this case, which are more precise, which somehow solve some of the issues uh, and that also Gordon was talking about a bit of the beginning, which is duration might not be a good, good uh, measure of, of whether a, a job is filled or not. In this case, because they are all they are the employers, so they can observe whether a job is filled or not, because they post randomly wages on this platform, and then they observe whether uh, a job is, is employed or not. Think that the same thing you can do with when you are scraped data. So in this case, they have the right variable here on the left hand side, and they have the right variable also on the right hand side, meaning that this reward that they assign to each uh, uh, um, uh, job is, is randomly uh, given, which is independent, therefore, uh, to the characteristic of the worker or the firm. And so based on this, they can make up a measure of this uh, uh, level supply elasticity that they have space uh, based on experimental data. And when they do that and they compare it to the um, uh, estimate that they get using double machine learning, however, they get that this estimate. So the double machine learning here is in blue, and then the red ones are the experimental ones, and there are different types of elasticity. But I won't go into details here. But basically, the main message of this picture is that in experiments, as well as in machine learning, the elasticity is pretty close to zero, and the machine learning doesn't do too bad. Uh, when it comes to, to approximating or to estimating this, this elasticity, even compared to settings uh, where um, uh, uh, rewards are randomly assigned, and therefore, well, the weaker thing of a slight perfect setting for a causal estimation of this uh, elasticity, with the caveat that these are specific experiments or specific type of tasks, so there might be problems with certain validity, but if you abstract from those, uh, those are uh, perfect uh, measures. Okay. Uh, and the other important uh, also message from this is that this assumption that the, the um, because different experiments assign different uh, reward level, they can also look at whether this this estimated elasticity changes uh, depending on the level of wages or rewards in this setting, and again uh, this picture or uh, uh, or uh, a figure seems to confirm. That the elasticity doesn't change much depending on the level of operations. It's pretty close to zero, so there is market power, but it doesn't vary uh, uh, much. It's not that for certain level of wages, this elasticity is extremely high, for others, it's extremely low. So, uh, what do we take out of all this? Well, uh, 
and they try to break down uh, some of the problems, some of the implications that Gordon was mentioning at the beginning. So what's the loss for workers in productivity? Uh, and they, based on that model, um, uh, they estimate that there is a 30% loss um, uh, in, in wages uh, for, uh, for workers, meaning that the workers are paid 13% less than what they should be paid based on their uh, productivity in this setting of This doesn't say, however, that employers use their market power on purpose. If there is market power on a, mark, on a, on a given market, employers might just post wages and be able to find workers at the price uh, which is not the right price uh, uh, for, for that specific worker based on productivity, but that doesn't mean that they are exploiting workers on purpose. So in order to get at that question of whether employers are know about not that they have market power and they uh, on purpose post lower wages, they will need an experiment in which market power changes randomly across employers, which they don't have. However, uh, again, if you go back to the beginning, there might be workers might have specific tastes for doing certain tasks. And based on that, you can infer that for certain tasks, in certain labor markets for certain tasks, there, there might be more market powers than on others. And playing on that, they basically show that in tasks in which elasticity is high, also rewards are higher, which seems to be, or is at least in line with this idea that employers might somehow know that they have power on their platform and they might uh, uh, use it to pay uh, lower uh, wages. But that's still an open question and, and I think this is more of a suggestive uh, evidence. <laughs> what ties this monopsony power? And uh, this is my almost last slide and the last one, the conclusions. Uh, it's still unclear. So just going back to Metz, which is the beginning, it's, uh, it's still uh, largely uh, unclear. They propose some, some answers for this specific setting. One of them is that it's difficult for workers to find alternative jobs on their time, meaning that they say there is no single index. I don't know if they, it's, it's changed, but at least at that time, uh, there was no single index provided to convert jobs so that workers can couldn't easily uh, find uh, jobs that were perfect substitute to the job they were uh, looking at. Um, so this again introduces some fictions. Uh, and wage bargaining is also not allowed on MTAC. There are other platforms such as Upwards in which you can do some wage bargaining. And so they advise <laughs> that people should probably use those, those other uh, platforms, employees, uh, uh, but again, this might refer also to different types of employees. Probably, I want to talk about something about what that part is really about uh, simple tasks. Um, there are also off uh, platform um, systems that uh, employees seem to be using more and more often in order to get a sense of how good an employer is, which would work against this uh, market power, which seems to be pretty uh, uh, strong in this. So those are the conclusion of uh, the paper. I just want to add the first few bullet points. I think I can skip because I'm already two minutes late. But the uh, last one is that the uh, source of this monopsony power uh, is still uncertain. And, and that's something we have uh, discussed in the last slide. Once, and then, so I think that a huge question in labor markets and labor economics is indeed uh, for people who might be interested in researching this is first. Uh, trying to show even more evidence of how monopsony or monopsony power works in other settings, which are different from this one, these ones that have been analyzed uh, so far. And then, based on this, uh, uh, probably uh, this will lead us also to get a better understanding of what type of policy or labor market policy can work. Uh, I think there are a number of uh, uh, top notch labor economists who are now thinking much more about IO models, for instance. Uh, because it's true that the antitrust uh, competition uh, policy uh, should apply also to labor markets, but in practice it seems that this type of policy has been applied much more to product markets than to labor markets so far, still under this assumption that we already mind that labor markets are relatively competitive. If they are not, then, then um, uh, and if we know what type of source of these uh, problems or of this um, uh, um, lack of competition that we can also design policies that, uh, that can help uh, uh, workers and my labor markets to function better. 
And finally, uh, those are some of the papers which I found helpful uh, in uh, presenting this presentation, which are also online on this folder. So if you guys want to look at them, uh, you have them here. Okay. So that's all I have. Uh, I don't have a tattoo slide, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>